as much confusion as does exist on the subject of training, and it's almost omniprevalent, there is just as much, if not more, on the subject of nutrition. I hear it all the time with those who call me for phone consultations. One aspect of such confusion about nutrition, which is particularly widespread, is perhaps best exemplified in the story I'm about to relate. Some time ago, I received a phone call from a young man, probably in his mid-teens, who, as soon as he reached me on the phone, launched into what seemed like an endless series of questions concerning certain nutritional supplements. Without even announcing his name, he immediately set in asking me about the merits of a host of popular supplements, including Metrix, vanadyl sulfate, phosphagain, creatine, hot stuff, etc., insisting his lack of bodybuilding progress was due solely to his faulty nutrition. When I suggested that maybe his training might be the problem, he countered with an emphatic no, that he was training properly. Listening to him prattle on a while longer about nutrition, it finally occurred to me that since he was so very confused about nutrition, it was not likely he was clear and clean on the subject of how to best proceed with his training. And I turned out to be correct. I discovered that he was violating all of the laws of nature here. He knew absolutely nothing about intensity or the necessity of training to failure. He wasn't stimulating much, if anything, in the way of meaningful growth. And even if he had been, he was so grossly overtrained, working out five to six days a week for one and a half to two hours a day, that his body would not have had the resources necessary to produce growth. I finally put a stop to the lengthy catechism and said to him rather firmly, Young man, you remind me of the individual who earnestly desires a suntan but continues to insist on making the mistake of exposing himself to the light of the moon. Then wastes hundreds of dollars trying different suntan lotions, thinking the next one will solve his problem. Not that the issue of the suntan lotion is completely without import, I continued, but it only assumes relevance within the context of having satisfied nature's first fundamental requirement, which is the presence of a high-intensity sunlight stress. Do you see, listener, that the relationship of nutrition to bodybuilding is similar? While nutrition is clearly of objective importance in the lives of everyone, it has a somewhat different role in bodybuilding. It is only within the context of having first employed the proper training methodology that then becomes important. And then it is rather simple. In fact, as much confusion as exists on the subject of nutrition, it is really rather simple at least as it applies to us practically on a daily basis. The one guiding operative principle here is make a reasonable effort on a daily basis to consume a well-balanced diet. Ours has been called an age of complexity, with intellectual confusion as its primary characteristic. This is the result of people not learning to think in terms of fundamentals and principles. A system of thought based on fundamental principles serves as an intellectual blueprint that enables one to answer specific concrete questions. Without such a fundamental base, questions continue to proliferate with no method for answering them, whether the subject is ethics, politics, training, or nutrition. The principle of a well-balanced diet is the fundamental that should guide your nutritional program. A well-balanced diet, by definition, is one that satisfies all your nutritional needs. Once you've made a reasonable effort to establish a balanced diet, consider quality supplements as those offered by TwinLab. The question that logically arises here is, what do I need calories and nutrients for? First of all, you need nutrients and calories to maintain your health and existing physical mass. Second, to provide for the production of muscle growth. One pound of muscle contains approximately 600 calories. And since muscle growth will rarely exceed one half pound a day, you won't have to increase your nutritional intake more than three to 500 calories a day beyond your daily maintenance level. And I'll address the topic of weight loss later. No matter what your daily calorie budget might happen to be, approximately 60% of the calories should be in the form of carbohydrates, 25% protein, and 15% fats. This ratio is agreed upon by all of the top reputable nutritional scientists, along with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Senate Subcommittee on Nutrition. The reason for the predominance of carbohydrates is that sugar is the preferred fuel source of the neuromuscular system, 
the most efficient fuel for high-intensity muscular contractions. Also, interestingly enough, the brain lives almost entirely off of sugar, deriving 99% of its nutrition from carbohydrates or sugar. In fact, 80% of the brain is made up of something called glia cells, whose primary function is to store sugar. The suffix hydrate in the word carbohydrate means water. And muscle tissue is not mostly protein, but water, 72% to be precise. Glucose is stored in the muscle as a polymer or chain of glucose molecules called glycogen. And it is primarily the glycogen that keeps the water in the muscle cell with three grams of water bonded to every gram of glycogen. If you've ever been on a low carbohydrate diet and found that your muscles became flaccid or deflated after a few days, it was because as the glycogen was used up, the water that was attached to it left the muscle. While protein has been the most overemphasized nutrient, carbohydrates have been the most maligned. The anti-carbohydrate litany began in Britain in the early 1950s and reached its apex in the United States, where diet books by so-called experts blame carbohydrates for everything from obesity to schizophrenia. Many people still believe that carbohydrates make you fat, which simply isn't true. No nutrient makes you fat in and of itself. Calories consumed beyond maintenance and growth needs result in fat deposition, whether the calories are from protein, carbohydrates, or fat. As stated previously, carbohydrates are vitally important in the diet of everyone, especially bodybuilders, as they are the preferred fuel source of high-intensity anaerobic training and the brain, which derives most of its nutrition from sugar. So I don't think eating carbohydrates causes schizophrenia. With regard to the issue of getting fat, I used to believe it was common knowledge that excess calories were responsible for fat buildup. Apparently, I was wrong. In my many daily phone conversations with bodybuilders from all over the world, I see that many don't know much about the caloric dimension of nutrition. Most remarkable was a client of mine, and Dorian Yates, who happens to travel a lot as he is an agent for some of the top music groups. Last year, while in England on business, I set him up to meet Dorian, and they had breakfast together. The conversation centered mostly around bodybuilding and the fact that my client was having a very difficult time losing fat. Dorian's suggestion to my client was that he was eating too little, which was why he was fat, and that he should boost his calories from his maintenance level of around 2,200 all the way up to 4,500. This would somehow boost his metabolism, Dorian insisted, and he'd soon be losing fat rather easily. When my client informed me of this upon his return home, I said that Dorian's advice was ludicrous, and that if he followed it, he'd be sorry. He insisted that no, Dorian is Mr. Olympia, he knows what he is talking about, and that he was going to enthusiastically follow his advice and increase his food consumption up to over 4,000 calories a day. Two weeks later or so, I saw my client in the gym looking rather despondent. When I asked him what the problem was, he said that rather than lose weight, he put on six pounds of fat since trying the higher calorie intake. I did not say, I told you so, but explained it with the simple logic. Look, I said, if one must increase his calories and eat large quantities of food to lose weight, how does one gain weight? By eating small amounts of food while dramatically decreasing calorie intake? I got the point, was his reply. On to the subject of protein. Yes, protein is very important, of course. It is a maintenance, repair, and growth substance that must be taken in sufficient quantities to ensure optimal muscle growth. Indulging indiscriminately in massive excesses of protein beyond maintenance and growth needs, however, will not somehow cause you to grow any faster had you merely satisfied need. Remember, listener, muscle is not comprised mostly of protein, but water. Again, 72%. This does not mean that you should begin drinking gallons of water a day to hasten the muscle growth process. You'll be very uncomfortable if you try it, and the excess will merely be passed out of the body. Don't be concerned with consuming hundreds of grams of protein a day, or so many grams per kilo of body weight, thinking that so doing will somehow speed the muscle growth process. Force feeding yourself massive quantities of protein could result in fat deposition, 
fats are not nearly the bogeyman some make them out to be. They play a crucial role in proper nutrition, in sheathing the nerves, synthesizing many enzymes, and in helping the digestive process. Unless you are directed by a physician, don't take in less than the recommended 15%. Make a reasonable effort each day to obtain a 60-25-15 ratio of carbohydrates to protein to fats. This may be accomplished rather easily by getting your daily complement from each of the four basic food groups, namely cereals and grains, fruits and vegetables, meat, fish and poultry, milk and dairy products. Consuming fats does not make you fat either. Recently a training client said to me that whenever he eats fats he gets fat. And I told him that such is not true. That if I was to have him eat a small piece of butter or lard, such would not turn to fat unless he were consuming an excess of calories. Years ago, I had a friend who went off to Montana every few winters or so to climb mountains every day for a month. Upon leaving for his trip, my friend was always rather pudgy, and one month hence, after climbing mountains every day, he returned very lean, with almost no visible body fat. While climbing mountains, he lived predominantly on fats, such as bacon, butter, beef, and animal fat. Obviously, this individual was expending more calories through his rigorous mountain climbing activity than he was consuming, and as a result, he lost body weight in the form of fat. The only problem with fats is that they contain 9 calories a gram, as opposed to only 4 calories a gram for both protein and carbohydrates. The point here is that if you're not careful with regard to your intake of fats, the number of calories from them can shoot up very fast, and before you know it, there is fat deposition. With regards to vitamins and minerals, they are referred to as micronutrients because they are needed in such small quantities. Recommended daily allowances of the micronutrients are measured in micrograms as opposed to the grams used to measure the macronutrients. Vitamins and minerals combine in the body to form the enzymes that serve as catalysts in countless important physiologic processes. It is interesting to note here that while most Americans are well nourished, many bodybuilders are grossly overnourished, yet they still don't see satisfactory results from their training effort. This serves only to underscore the point that training is the first primary requirement while nutrition is secondary. It is only within the context of having satisfied nature's first fundamental requirement, the imposition of a high-intensity training stress, that nutrition then becomes important for the bodybuilder. In looking back to my own bodybuilding career, I too wasted considerable time owing to ignorance and confusion. In fact, when I reflect on how many training and dietary mistakes I made through the years, it is a wonder that I made it as far as I did. I unwittingly allowed myself to become deluded by uncritically reading certain muscle magazines, especially their fraudulent, seductive advertising, which promised that we could all become bodybuilding champions almost overnight if only we would invest considerable money in a certain product. A good example was the one that promised a pound a day muscle gains if one were to drink Crash Formula Number no. 7 every day. Yes, it actually promised a pound a day of muscle. A very enthusiastic but ignorant bodybuilder, I fell for that one hook, line, and sinker and gained from 180 pounds to 250 pounds, most of the weight being fat, in seven months. How clever I thought I was. The only reason I didn't go up to 280 pounds, which was my goal, was because my parents weren't willing to foot the milk bill anymore as I was drinking up to two gallons a day. On top of that, I was growing rather concerned about the stretch marks which began populating a good portion of the surface of my body, along with the fact that I outgrew two or three wardrobes. The next six months I spent trying to undo the damage. You see, it was in vogue back then to bulk up and then cut down, which meant to gain as much weight as possible despite its composition, then lose the fat and be left with just the muscle. Well, by the time I finished getting rid of the fat more than six months later, I ended up weighing but 169 pounds, less than my starting weight of 180, and with less muscle. The near-starvation diet 
and gross overtraining that led to such a weight loss caused me to lose muscle. So much for bulking up and cutting down. Despite that and other mistakes, I never forsook my dream of becoming an accomplished bodybuilder. All through the years, I read the muscle magazines voraciously, never missing a trick. I knew every fad diet that came down the line and tried them all. And everybody was supposed to train differently and follow different diets because we were told everyone is different. The bottom line, so they said, was that because we were each unique and possessed different requirements in regard to training and nutrition, it was up to the individual to discover what was best for him. No wonder I and untold others were confused about training and nutrition. What a massive contradiction. The very people who were selling us the science of bodybuilding were now telling us that bodybuilding is anything but exact, that there are no universal principles or truths, and they continue with the same irrationality today. Bodybuilding cannot be a science under those conditions. And as much as bodybuilding has been touted as a science, very few have brought critical attention to bear on the subject. As a result, falsehoods abound, severely hampering the thinking of the majority. There is a notion that has been floating around the bodybuilding subculture for years, which has it that bodybuilding is 80% nutrition and only 20% training. The implication here is that it doesn't matter how you train, or even that you train at all. If you will only agree to consume an excess of nutrients, you'll grow muscle beyond normal levels. And such simply is not true. As the nature of the human physiology absolutely requires that certain specific training causes be enacted to affect the buildup of muscles beyond normal levels. Or, in other words, consuming excess nutrients will not undo the effects of an improper training program. More recently, another erroneous idea has garnered considerable attention in the bodybuilding subculture is that one should consume 10,000 calories a day for best results. And it is the single most ludicrous crack brain theory ever spawned in this sport or industry. And it flows from the notion that there is no such thing as overtraining, only undereating. To help ensure that bodybuilders don't undereat, some have suggested that bodybuilders consume 10,000 calories a day, a staggering number of calories, more than any bodybuilder on earth, I don't care how large he is, requires to build larger muscles. When one of my phone consultation clients recently asked me if he should try consuming 10,000 calories a day, I of course replied emphatically that he should not, then proceeded to logically demonstrate why such would be absurd. After establishing that my client only required 3,000 calories a day to maintain his existing body weight of 175 pounds, I asked him if he thought it was realistic to assume he would need 7,000 additional calories to provide for daily muscle growth production needs, assuming he was stimulating growth in the first place. When that this didn't seem logical, rational, or realistic, I explained that if he were training properly and stimulating 50 pounds of muscle growth a year, which is considerable, more than most are likely to gain, that this would average out to but slightly over two ounces of muscle gained a day. Since my client required 3,000 calories a day to maintain 175 pounds, why would he need another whopping 7,000 calories more to provide for but a mere two ounces of muscle growth. Yes, listener, 3,000 calories to maintain 175 pounds and 7,000 calories to produce but two ounces of muscle. Such notions are always presented out of context with neither a theory nor an iota of evidence to support them. In logic, these are referred to as baseless, arbitrary assertions. And as Ayn Rand has stated, there is no room for the arbitrary in the affairs of man, least of all in the realm of cognition. With a properly conducted high-intensity training program, you will grow stronger each and every workout. And make no mistake, listener, developing stronger muscles is a prerequisite of developing bigger muscles. Whenever someone starts to argue with me on that point, I say, 
What is one supposed to do to grow larger? Get weaker? Yes, if you want to grow larger, you must grow stronger. There is definitely a relationship between strength and muscular size. Most obvious is the fact that heavyweight weightlifters and powerlifters are stronger than light weightlifters. And everyone listening to this who ever developed larger muscles observed an attendant increase in strength. No one who ever lifted weights grew larger without growing stronger. It just doesn't happen. It was discovered by exercise scientists long ago that the strength of a muscle is related to the size of its cross-sectional area. Many are still confused on this subject because they see some who are smaller, who possess less muscle mass, that can lift more weight than other larger, more heavily muscled individuals. The mistake here is in attempting to draw a meaningful comparison between two different individuals. The fact is that the man with smaller muscles will grow larger only as he grows stronger, and likewise, the larger man will grow larger still only as he grows stronger. Don't make the mistake of comparing yourself to others. The only person you can accurately compare yourself to is you. And as long as you are increasing in strength as a result of each workout, you are heading in the right direction. And you will grow, but only so long as you are on a proper nutritional program. You will grow stronger each workout as a result of following the workout suggested on the previous tape. When a person grows stronger week to week, it is proof that there is a positive change taking place inside of his muscles. Since muscles, by definition, lift weights, a muscle growing stronger can't be exactly the same muscle. If it were exactly the same muscle, it would be limited to lifting exactly the same weight. The main point here is that as a muscle grows progressively stronger over a period of time, it is changing somehow. I'm not specifying what that change is now. I will. For now, just remember, if a muscle is growing stronger, it is in a process of positive change. If during this period of change, the bodybuilder continues to consume nutritionally a maintenance level of calories, by definition here, he will only maintain his existing physical mass. He won't lose, he won't gain, he'll maintain. It goes to the laws of physics or thermodynamics. You can't create something out of nothing. You can't build bigger muscles out of thin air. Certain nutritional and caloric values are absolutely required. What the bodybuilder will be doing by consuming a maintenance level of calories is in essence something less than desirable. To some extent at least, he'll be frustrating the needs of the growth mechanism. He did train to failure, which is what nature requires one do to trigger the growth mechanism into motion. Also, he is growing stronger. Therefore, the muscle is changing. When the growth mechanism is activated, you might visualize it as a moving conveyor belt of sorts, for lack of a better image, with a number of little men standing on top who are reaching up, they're reaching out to grab the nutritional caloric cement, as I like to call it, that it requires to build the second story, the new mass. But remember, consuming a maintenance level frustrates those little men, they are reaching up, but nothing is there. The body is only receiving enough nutritional and caloric values to maintain the first story, the existing physical mass. In such a case, the muscle change I was referring to earlier, where the bodybuilder is growing stronger, will remain primarily a qualitative strength change. It won't manifest much, if at all, as a quantitative muscle change, i.e., a muscle mass body weight increase. In order to avoid this, the frustrating of the growth mechanism, and to do the opposite, to serve the needs of the growth mechanism, one must consume a number of nutrients and calories above his daily maintenance level. He must go into a positive calorie balance. This can be done in a methodical, intelligent fashion, such that growth production needs are precisely met with little or no excess to cause any appreciable fat deposition. Before I explain how that may be accomplished, I'd like to make a few side comments. It has been claimed by some that a positive calorie balance is not necessary to build new lean mass while on a bodybuilding program. They say that the body can literally steal calories from fat and shunt them to the muscles for growth. 
In fact, this is exactly what Arthur Jones alleged occurred when Casey Viator gained 62 pounds of lean muscle mass during the one-month Colorado experiment described in my heavy-duty book number one. He postulated that the number of calories Casey consumed that month weren't sufficient to account for all of the weight gained. Casey was not on a weight loss or maintenance diet. According to observers of the experiment, Jones literally force-fed Casey everything he could shove down his throat, including the kitchen sink. It was calculated that Casey was fed only enough calories to account for 45 pounds of lean muscle mass increase. Therefore, that 17 pounds of Casey's fat was sacrificed somehow to build muscle. As a parenthetic note here, using a sophisticated radioisotope assay test, the researchers involved with the Colorado experiment ascertained that despite Casey's registering 45 pounds of weight gained on the scale, he had also lost 17 pounds of fat that month. Therefore, his total lean mass gain was 62 pounds. While there may be some truth to this claim, I am skeptical. I suspect that either Jones's calculations were skewed and or he really believed Casey wasn't on steroids at the time, which he was. Steroids are extremely potent chemical agents which dramatically alter the body's biochemistry in many ways, two of them being that protein synthesis and glycogen water storage inside the muscle are greatly enhanced. So, while stolen calories may account for some of the lean muscle mass, I believe that the steroids help too. This is the end of side one. Please turn over the tape at this point to continue with side two. I conducted a personal experiment years ago in which I went on a calorie deficit weight loss diet while training without steroids and the first week I lost nine pounds. Then I went on the same diet while taking steroids and I gained two pounds the first week. One point worth making here is that the stealing of calories from adiposity would be a genetically mediated trait and like all other genetic traits its expression how efficiently one's body makes use of calories from fat to form muscle would vary across a broad range from those whose body is poor at stealing calories from fat to those whose is very effective and everything in between prior to my emphasizing the caloric dimension of nutrition to my clients most would grow stronger, but many didn't gain the mass and body weight they desired. Since reducing the volume and frequency of their training, as described on tape two, as well as emphasizing the need for a positive calorie balance, my clients' mass and body weight increases are finally keeping pace with their strength gains, and in the majority of cases, little or none of the weight gain is fat. As mentioned earlier, whereas one, two, or three or four years ago, I would only occasionally have a client gain 10 to 20 pounds in a month or 30 to 40 pounds in three to five months. Now it is no longer the occasional or exceptional case. It is the rule. For those who are acceptably lean, as well as those who may be concerned they have a bit too much fat presently, I'd suggest you embark on the suggested routine while in a positive calorie balance of three to 500 a day. For that second group, who may have a little more fat than they'd like, I propose that you place your fat loss concerns on hold for two or three months, put on 10 to 20 pounds of muscle, then go on a fat loss diet, at the end of which you'll not only be leaner, you'll have the extra muscle too. For those who are extremely overweight, who would like to build muscle, yet must lose fat, don't worry. There is a way of dealing with that efficaciously, and I'll get to it soon. The goal, remember, listener, is to serve the nutritional caloric needs of the growth mechanism to gain muscle mass and increase body weight while adding little or no body fat. To do so in a methodical fashion, start by keeping a five-day food diary. Write down everything you eat for five days and don't become self-conscious during that period and alter what you have typically been eating. What is needed is a representative sampling so it may be ascertained what your daily average calorie intake is. Write down everything you eat for five days and the quantity. Be as accurate with the quantity as possible, but don't fret if you think you're off a little. At the conclusion of each of the five days, sit down with a good calorie counting book, 
If you don't have one, buy one, as every conscientious bodybuilder should have one since the caloric dimension of nutrition is vitally important, and tally the total calories for the day. At the end of the fifth day, take the five daily totals, add them for a grand total, divide by five, and you'll have, of course, your daily average caloric intake. You must also weigh yourself at the beginning of day one and on the morning of day six. If you didn't gain or lose during that five-day period, your daily average is also your daily maintenance level of calories. Let's assume, hypothetically, that your daily maintenance level of calories turns out to be 2100. Upon starting the suggested routine, make a conscientious, disciplined daily effort to keep your calories three to 500 above the maintenance level. If you don't, you'll maintain, you won't gain. But I'm not suggesting that all of a sudden you should start shoveling down indiscriminately large amounts of food. You'll only get fat. I have observed with my phone clients that some, not many, do not have a set maintenance calorie level, but a maintenance calorie range. If after two weeks into the training program, with a positive calorie balance as suggested, you haven't gained a couple of pounds, you might be just such an individual, so increase your calories another 300. And the calorie increase should conform roughly with the 60-25-15 ratio, with perhaps a bit greater emphasis on protein. Those who do as indicated and conscientiously keep watch of their calories so that they're in a positive balance of three to 500 a day will be quite delighted. In addition to growing stronger every workout, he'll gain seven, eight, nine, ten or more pounds the first month. I can't say with any certainty just how much you might gain due to genetic variations. As mentioned previously, there are slightly more than 600 calories in a pound of muscle. If you are stimulating three pounds of muscle growth a week, you will require roughly 600 times three or 1800 calories per week above maintenance. This translates to 257 calories a day above maintenance. I am recommending slightly higher so there's less chance of any slightest frustrating of the nutritional caloric needs of the growth mechanism. Let's assume, in your particular case, that your growth requirements don't necessitate a full 300 calories a day above maintenance. Then yes, the excess will turn to fat. However, there are 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. If you required only 150 calories a day above maintenance, the other 150 would turn to fat. But you would only gain one pound of fat a month. For those with a higher metabolic rate or who have a difficult time consuming even a maintenance level of calories, I suggest Twin Labs RX Fuel to help boost your calorie intake. For those interested in losing fat, reduce your calorie intake by 500 to 1,000 a day below maintenance level and you'll lose one to two pounds of fat a week. And as long as you're on a proper high-intensity training program, you won't lose muscle and you will likely even gain some. Reducing your calories 500 to 1,000 per day is sufficient to starve the fat enough to see a meaningful loss, yet still be enough to feed the lean mass and provide for some growth. Once you've lost the desired weight, go into a positive calorie balance as described. Recently, one of my phone clients reported that while on a calorie deficit diet, he lost 11 pounds of body weight over a three-month period, increased his strength considerably, and even gained a half an inch on his arms. The loss of body weight would have been predominantly or exclusively fat, with certainly none of it being from the contractile protein element in the muscle, as he did grow stronger and put one half inch on his arms. One cannot lose muscle and grow stronger. This gain of muscle mass while losing fat does not prove that his body stole calories from fat and shunted them to the muscles. It demonstrates that when you're in a modest negative calorie balance, the fat can be starved sufficiently to be used as fuel, and yet enough nutrition still provided to maintain lean mass and allow for at least some muscle growth production. I told my client, however, that as well as he did in terms of strength and lean mass increases, he would have done better on a positive calorie balance. As a bodybuilder continues to gain muscle mass and body weight, his maintenance level of calories gradually goes up until finally weight gains slow down, then come to a halt. 
when you see that your weight gains have slowed down, increase your calories another three to 500, and you'll resume gaining. Likewise, as a person continues to lose weight, his maintenance level goes down, and the weight loss diminishes and eventually comes to a halt. When this starts to happen, reduce calories by another 500 or so a day, and the weight loss will continue. It has been suggested by many reputable nutritional scientists that when on a weight loss program, the individual should not go below 12 to 1500 calories as it is impossible to obtain a well-balanced diet below that level. In cases of morbid obesity, it may be necessary to reduce calories even further, but only while under the care of a physician. One will know when he is too low in calories by the fact that he will stop dropping pounds precipitously rather than one to two pounds a week he'll start losing four to five pounds a week or even more. This rate of weight loss is indicative that one muscles have begun to catabolize, which is undesirable for a number of reasons, the least of which is that the loss of lean mass will slow down the metabolism. Since muscle only has 600 calories per pound versus the 3,500 calories per pound of fat, the body will burn up to six pounds of muscle to get the same caloric yield as from one pound of fat, hence the much increased rate of weight loss. For those desiring to lose weight, yes, low carbohydrate diets do work, but like all diets that work, it does so by being a calorie deficit diet, one that is lower in calories than maintenance level. You'd be better to reduce the calories of all the macronutrients instead of just one, or you run the risk of not obtaining a well-balanced diet. And if you are on a well-balanced diet with a calorie deficit, it won't hurt your weight loss efforts to have an occasional treat such as a candy bar, piece of pizza, or some ice cream. Just take into account the calories they contain, figure it into your daily calorie budget, and subtract some other food item. A question I get literally almost every day from clients is whether or not it is important to eat six meals a day. And the answer is no it is not necessary to have six formal meals a day. The body is quite resourceful in that if you were to skip even one of the three square meals in a day, it would make up for it by utilizing more of the nutrients than usual from the next meal. Eat your three square meals a day plus a snack or two along with your supplements and you'll be fine. To disrupt one's life to such an extent that he's taking the time to prepare six formal meals a day is to make nutrition a neurotic obsession when it should be viewed primarily as a basic need where no more time than is minimally required is spent fulfilling it. When a bodybuilder is actually gaining muscle mass as well as getting stronger, he should see a reciprocally reinforcing relationship between the two. In other words, his muscle mass increases will facilitate even greater strength increases, which in turn facilitate greater growth stimulation and the rate of your strength increase will serve as a relative indice of how much growth is being stimulated. If you are only increasing a rep or so here and there, obviously there is less growth stimulation than if you're increasing in strength by leaps and bounds. If at some point you believe you may need more than a three to 500 positive calorie balance, go higher, but be cautious and methodic. Go up a couple of hundred calories at a time, and keep tabs on your body weight. If at some point you start gaining very rapidly, check to make sure it's muscle, and if not, simply cut back. Gaining fat is anathema for the bodybuilder, certainly never to one's advantage. A right-thinking bodybuilder should desire to gain only muscle, as his goal is not to be only muscularly massive, but also defined in appearance. It is not necessary, as I was led to believe 30 years ago, that one must bulk up, that is, gain fat with muscle, to build muscle, which was a very common belief. The more fat one puts on, the longer and harder he'll have to diet to get it off. And I can tell you from personal experience, it's not fun. Now, with regard to supplements, there is mounting evidence to suggest that even with a well-balanced diet, it is impossible to get enough of certain nutritional substances. One of them is creatine, an important component in the phosphocreatine compound within the muscle itself necessary for maximum energizing and growth. 
I first started hearing about the positive effects of creatine a year and a half ago as a remarkably large number of my phone clients began reporting to me, unsolicited, that whenever they took creatine they trained better and gained faster. I found this rather astonishing as I don't ever recall in all of my 33 years of bodybuilding having heard such a redounding endorsement of any supplement. And while such would be endorsement enough for most, I remain somewhat skeptical. Then I was approached by Steve Blackman, owner of Twin Lab, to lend my personal endorsement to his Creatine Fuel Plus. When I expressed my skepticism to Mr. Blackman, he stated emphatically that the reason he wanted me in particular to endorse this product was because of my strict adherence to science in bodybuilding and that this was the one supplement that had the greatest scientific medical research backing it. Mr. Blackman knew that my main thrust with regard to nutrition was that the individual should seek to consume a well-balanced diet on a daily basis, and he agrees. He then explained that the research indicated that even when consuming a well-balanced diet, including up to two pounds of red meat a day, which is high in creatine, such was not sufficient to load the muscles with creatine. I responded by pointing out that I had never pretended to have exhaustive knowledge on the subject of nutrition or supplements, and that what he had just explained certainly sounded plausible. As telling testimony to his honesty and sound business ethics, Mr. Blackman said he didn't want me to accept the endorsement offer on his verbal recommendation alone, and that he would send me the scientific literature on the subject of creatine's importance in fueling anaerobic high-intensity training. And he did, volumes of it, in fact. It was from a variety of researchers and nutritional specialists, and as all agreed that creatine added to a well-balanced diet increased the efficiency of high-intensity exercise, I ceased being so skeptical. Now that all remained was for me to try it personally. The past six years, I have worked seven days a week to build my business. And when my business kept me working up to 10 hours or more a day, I decided to stop training for a while. Well, a while turned into four long years, and I slipped into the worst shape of my life. So when I finally decided to start training again on October 24th, 1995, I did so with some trepidation. Because my muscles had atrophied, or shrunk considerably, and I added 25 pounds of fat while having become very deconditioned, I feared that even mild or moderate intensity workouts would see me nauseous, sore, and feeling out of sorts. But none of that happened. While I was planning on holding back on the first several workouts, such has always been difficult, and it was this time. By the end of the first workout, I had realized that I had gone to complete failure in all of my sets, exerting 100% intensity of effort, and with a minimum of rest between sets. Not only was I not sick or tired, I literally felt indefatigable, as though I could go on indefinitely, and I gained 30 pounds of muscle or so the first month. That sounds like a lot, and it is, but remember, I was regaining muscle, which is always easier than gaining it for the first time. Having come back from numerous layoffs in the past, never had I felt this good, nor had I ever gained so much muscle in such a short period. And I attribute some of this, at least, to taking Creatine Fuel Plus daily. My phone consultation clients, not to mention Steve Blackman, were right. Finally, a supplement that serves to truly augment a proper training and rest program. I don't want to mislead anyone. No supplement is magic. Without proper training, adequate rest and nutrition, no one is going to gain optimally. For those not privy to the scientific research and literature, obtain an exercise science or physiology textbook, and usually in the first chapter there is a complete section on the energy metabolism of muscles. In the subsection on the metabolism of anaerobic activity, there is considerable space devoted to the importance of creatine in fueling high-intensity exercise. It only stands to reason that muscles loaded with creatine will perform better and respond better. Simple enough. Back to the concept need. The concept need plays a crucial epistemological or intellectual role in nutrition. 
one in fact that reverberates throughout the entire realm of biology. If you've ever studied physiology, psychology, or sociology, you've no doubt encountered the concept need. Indeed, the concept need plays an important role in bodybuilding science. A rational bodybuilder does not train beyond need or necessity because this constitutes overtraining, which results in lack of progress and even the loss of muscle. And he does not want to consume food beyond need since that results in the laying down of fat. Bodybuilding, like I've learned, is true of every other subject in human life, can also be ultimately understood in terms of basic principles. They are, number one, train hard, train to failure to stimulate growth, number two, don't overtrain, get adequate rest, and number three, eat a well-balanced diet, with number two and three being required so that the body can produce the muscle growth that the workout merely stimulated. With regard to point number three, once you have formulated a diet that is reasonably well-balanced, then supplement. The most popular supplements with my training clients are Ripped Fuel for increased energy and fat burning, RX Fuel for extra protein and overall nutritional insurance, Creatine Fuel for enhanced strength, power, and muscle growth, and finally Sport Fuel, vitamin and mineral formula which is specially designed for athletes and bodybuilders as it is rich in antioxidant nutrients that have been shown to prevent muscle damage. If you had just arrived from the planet Mars onto the Earth and decided you wanted to build your muscles, and I told you that all that is required is one workout lasting 15 to 20 minutes every four to seven days or so, such would not strike you as too much or too little. You would have an unobstructed look at the matter. As a fresh arrival from the planet Mars, your thinking would be unhampered by all of the unwarranted assumptions, false generalizations, and undefined contradictions about weight training that are floating like so much cognitive detritus, polluting the intellectual atmosphere of the Earth's bodybuilding subculture. The main point to keep in mind is that bodybuilding is anaerobic, which is antipodal to aerobic. Their defining principles, remember, are opposites. Anaerobic, high intensity, short duration, versus aerobic, low intensity, long duration. Most of the information presented on these first three tapes is not new. What I did was take some well-known, well-authenticated facts from exercise and nutritional science and apply them to the unique needs of the bodybuilder. And it is up to each and every listener to work with the further practical application to make the concepts work for his unique needs. Yes, we all have unique needs. This does not contradict my earlier assertion that we are all essentially the same. We are all most unique in that each of us occupies a different space and time. Regarding nutrition, we all metabolize food at various rates. That is, we possess varying metabolic rates. Because we have different metabolic rates, we get fat, lose weight, and grow muscle at varying rates of speed. While this is patently evident that we possess different metabolic rates, what is less obvious but very important is that the physiologic principles governing metabolism are universal. The chemical processes governing our utilization of food for energy, maintenance, repair, and growth have been clearly mapped and circumscribed by physiologists long ago. Pick up any textbook on exercise physiology or nutritional science and you'll be reading about what goes on inside of yourself and your neighbor and your training partner and everyone. So while we each possess the unique stamp of an unrepeatable, irreplaceable personality, we're not all that different inside. We all need protein. We all require sleep. We all burn carbohydrates at the rate of four calories per gram. We all need intense exercise to stimulate growth. We each possess a limited recovery ability, and as bodybuilders know, muscle growth beyond normal levels is never fast enough. Although you'll be delightfully surprised when you apply the knowledge gained from these tapes. Considering what you know now, having listened to these tapes, are you going to let some hulk guide you in the wrong direction merely because he has a 19-inch arm? Are you going to allow your subsequent training activities and dietary practices be continually dominated by the bootleg logic, more is better. He who acts contrary to what his perceptions and rational thoughts tell him is the truth 
is akin to Dostoyevsky's underground man who cries, what do I care for the laws of nature and arithmetic when for some reason I don't like them, or the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Yes, you are free to evade the responsibility of rational thought and logical deliberation, but not free to escape the consequences. It's up to you. This concludes tape 3. Please go to tape number 4, Menser, The Man and the Controversy.